What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now that, that question, are you having fun yet, seems like a rather odd question to ask in church. Most people, as uh, uh, the guys uh, illustrated for us just a few moments ago, most people do not associate fun with, uh, with church or even the Christian life. And, and quite frankly, that, that, that way of thinking is, is founded on two propositions, two false propositions. Let me throw them out to you today. The first is this. Many people believe, hey, 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 Brian, you're not supposed to have fun in church. Why, why Christians aren't supposed to have fun. Those that come from a more puritanical uh, form of worship lead towards that, that serious, contemplative worship style. Uh, their minds, or in their minds, spiritual things should always be serious. Spiritual things should always be solemn. Spiritual things should, should always be uh, somber. Uh, you've been in churches like that. And uh, some of us might actually think that today. Uh, the comedian Groucho Marx, I'm not sure whether you heard this, the comedian Groucho Marx was, was in a hotel lobby one time, and, and a minister in a clerical uh, a collar recognizes him and runs over to him and says, uh, Mr. Marx, Groucho, uh, thank you so much for bringing joy and laughter into people's lives. Groucho immediately responded, looking at the minister, and said, and thank you, sir, for taking so much joy and laughter out of their lives. If we're not careful, that's the, that's the view that we have, that, that spiritual things and, uh, and, and church and even living the Christian life sucks all of the joy out of life. And that simply is not true. There, there's others that sit back and, and think, not only shouldn't you have fun in church, but you can't have fun in church. In their minds, worship is not something to be enjoyed. Worship is something to be endured. I trust that you don't feel that way this morning. I trust that as you meet together with God's people, you come with a sense of expectation. You come with a sense of joy. You come with a sense of excitement as we not only meet together with one another, but we have the thrill, we have the joy of meeting together with God. You see, it's important for us to realize that God thinks differently. God, God desires for His people to have fun. God desires for His people to enjoy life. We actually see that in the verses that we're studying today. And so, uh, as I mentioned, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put it up on the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm going to read out of the NLT. You follow along in whatever translation that you have. Notice what Solomon says in verse 7. He says, so go ahead, eat your food with joy, and drink your wine with a happy heart. For God approves of this. Uh, wear fine clothes with a splash of cologne. Notice verse 9. Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward 
for all of your earthly toil. Whatever you do, do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. Verse 11, I have observed something under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. And the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. People can never predict when hard times might come. Isn't that true? Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. Verse 13, here is another bit of wisdom that has impressed me as I've watched the way our world works. There was a small town with only a few people and a great king came with his army and besieged it. A poor wise man knew how to save the town and so it was rescued, but afterward no one thought to thank him. So even though wisdom is better than strength, though who are wise will be despised as if they are poor. What they say will not be appreciated for long. Better to hear the quiet words of a wise person than the shouts of a foolish king. Better to have wisdom than weapons of war. But one sinner can destroy much that is good. Notice chapter 10 and verse 1. As dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And Lord, thank you as we've already mentioned and sang about this morning. Thank you that you are here with us. Holy Spirit of God, you're welcome, not only in this building, but we welcome you to work in our hearts and in our lives. Father, help us not to have the mindset that, that, that if we really give our lives to Jesus, that all the fun is sucked out of our life, that, that we just can't enjoy life. Rather, help us to understand the truth that Solomon is conveying here that life is truly enjoyed whenever we understand the purpose for which we were created. Life is truly enjoyed whenever we take advantage of the blessings that you give to us. And yes, life is truly enjoyed whenever we demonstrate wisdom instead of foolishness in our lives. So Lord, as we walk through these verses today, I pray that you'd help us to understand them. Not only to understand them, but help us to apply them to our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Uh, Quite frankly, most people would not characterize the book of Ecclesiastes as being lighthearted. As you've walked with us through the book, I think you've noticed that that the things that Solomon talks about in these chapters are are deep. They're, They're contemplative, maybe even just a little bit melancholic. They're they're thought-provoking. It's not uh, happy terms that Solomon uses, and and we don't walk away Sunday after Sunday kind of skipping out of here saying, man, isn't life grand? Solomon has caused us to take a personal look at ourselves. Solomon has caused us to examine ourselves in the light of Scripture, to meditate on our motives, and to reflect upon his purpose in our lives. Uh, Here's the question. What are we living for anyways? Why is it that we're alive? Why is it that God has created us? Why is it that God every morning wakes us up and, and gives us new breath and a new day to serve him? Solomon talks about that in the verses that we read and we're studying this morning. And he gives three highly practical exhortations for us as we pursue a life that truly pleases God. And so you have your outlines in front of you. The very first thing that Solomon says is this. He says, enjoy life. Enjoy life. Here Solomon employs a phrase that he has already used 
several times. As a matter of fact, we find this same phrase three previous times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Notice in chapter 2 and verse 24, he said, So I decided that there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. Chapter 3 and verse 13, he said, And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. Chapter 8 and verse 15, So I recommend having fun. I bet you didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Solomon said, So I recommend having fun, for there is nothing better for the people in this world than to eat, drink, and here he says it again, to enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all of the hard work that God has given them under the sun. So, so this morning, catch that. There you and I have it from a reliable source. God wants us to have fun. God wants us to enjoy life. Let me make just a couple of simple observations there that's probably already running through your mind, or at least the mind of some of you this morning. The first is this. The secular world has the false notion that you cannot be a Christian and really enjoy life. Let me ask, did anybody think that before you gave your life to Christ? Anybody here this morning, one or two of you? All right, uh, maybe the rest of us weren't that honest, but, 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 but a lot of people, a lot of people think that. Oh my word, if I give my life to the Lord and if every week I sit back and say, okay, I'm going to make a commitment to go to church and all of a sudden as if the enjoyment of life ends, as if being a Christian sucks all of the fun out of life. I would also say this though. As the guys illustrated just a few moments ago, what non-believers view as fun often does not honor and please God. So the simple fact that, that God says enjoy life and have fun doesn't necessarily mean that he gives us a license to do whatever we want because what we want often is not good for us. Uh, I would make a third statement. Some of the happiest, some of the craziest, some of the most fun-loving people that I know are dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. They love the Lord, and yet they also love life, and they're crazy, and they have fun. Some of you are crazy. Some of you have fun, and you encourage me, because as I watch you live life, I enjoy watching you live and enjoy life. And the fourth thing is this, God desires for you to enjoy your life. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, you don't have any, you don't have any idea of the things that I'm going through today. Listen, God desires for you to enjoy your life. God desires for you, yes, to have fun. So what does that mean? Well, here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon lays out some principles to help explain what God means, all right? So if you're following along in your outline, the very first thing he says is this, food is a gift from God, enjoy it. Notice what he says in verse 7, so go ahead, eat your food with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart. Admittedly, most of us like to eat. Anybody here like to eat? Boy, it's amazing when I asked the first question, nobody responded. And when I asked the eating question, everybody responds. Well, here Solomon acknowledges the fact that God has given us food for our enjoyment. So I want to pause. I want to give you some really deep theology this morning. Are you ready? Here's a theology lesson. Here's a deep theology lesson this morning. A beautifully ripened and sweet watermelon comes from God. Enjoy it. A crisp salad comes from God. Enjoy it. Grilled mahi-mahi comes from God. Enjoy it. A juicy, loaded cheeseburger comes from God. Enjoy it. All right? 
cookie dough ice cream with brownie bits in it. Comes from God. Enjoy it. Can I get an amen, church? Uh That's good preaching, is it not? You might walk away from here today saying, boy, that's, that's the best preaching I've ever heard Brian say, all right? Food comes from God. Enjoy it. Now, in reality, okay, contextually, Solomon is not just talking about the food that we eat. Uh, Rather, Solomon is talking about the meal that is enjoyed together. You see, the average Jewish family began the day with an early snack and then had a light meal, what we would call brunch, somewhere around 10 to noon in the morning. Then they didn't eat. They didn't eat together until after sunset. When their work was done, they would gather together for that main meal of the day. It was their personal family celebration. Actually, he describes it in verse 8. Notice what he says in verse 8. The New Living Translation says it this way, wear fine clothes in a splash of cologne. I prefer what the ESV says. The ESV says it this way, let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. You say, Brian, what does that mean? The Jewish family, when they celebrated together, when they came together, they put on their white garments. Those were their celebration garments. And when they ate together as a family, they put on those celebration garments. They bathed. They put oil on their heads. He's talking about the time that they came together as a family and they enjoyed the blessings that God had given to them. You see, the meal was a communal act of fellowship. It was a commitment and a celebration. It was a time for family to rejoice and enjoy together all that God had given to them. Let me ask you this morning, are your meals like that? You might sit back and say, Brian, I don't think we wear white and we don't put oil on our head. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about, uh, are your meals a celebration, a family celebration of God's blessings on your life? Man, let me step on some toes today, ours included. I'm afraid that all too often we eat on the run as a family, do we not? Or maybe in front of the television sets, and we miss the camaraderie. We miss the fellowship. We miss the love of family. That's what Solomon is talking about. He's saying, as a family, yes, God has blessed you. God has given you food and wine and drink. Enjoy it, but enjoy it together with the family that God has given Notice the next phrase that Solomon uses. It's unique. So go ahead, eat your food with joy. Drink your wine with a happy heart. For God approves of this. What what a unique phrase. As I read that and prayed about that this week, my my thought was this. Okay, is God simply saying that I approve of the way that you eat. All right, guys, now you need to understand this because at times our wives disprove of the way we eat. And so pull out this verse and say, no, God approves of the way that I eat. I tell the story. You probably heard me tell the story. It was classic. Uh, A few years ago, Vicki and I were going in. What's that salad place that we go to on... um, Sweet tomatoes. Anybody know where sweet tomatoes is? We were going to sweet tomatoes for lunch because we were going to eat a salad for lunch. And, you know, we went through and, and ordered our salad. And there was a gentleman that I observed that, that he filled a plate. He put a little bit of green vegetables on it, all right? And then, I promise, he had about that much cheese on top of his salad. I mean, it was that much. And, and I, I tapped Vic on the shoulder. I said, boy, look at him. He's at least going to be able to go home and tell his wife, I had a salad for lunch today. I had a salad for lunch. Little salad, a lot of cheese. His wife approved of that. Well, well, is Solomon simply saying, eat whatever you want. God approves of that. Listen, here's what he's saying. He's saying God takes pleasure when we gather together and enjoy his blessing. I do believe, though, there's a little bit of a deeper meaning. Let me give you a couple of things as I wrote down and thought about this. The first is this. By faith, 
you are encouraged to enjoy the good things of life. You see, whenever we gratefully acknowledge by faith that everything we have comes from God, and by the way, that's one of the reasons we pray for our meal, and if we're not careful, prayer becomes a routine, and I even know that I'm guilty of praying the exact same thing every meal. Let's pray it quick. I know in our family, they always say we're hungry. Who prays the quickest? Brian, you pray the quickest so we can get eating, all right? But if we're not careful, we forget that the food that we have in front of us has come from God. And when we eat it, we eat it by faith. And we eat it with a heart of gratitude, realizing that God has given it to us. Whenever we break bread and fellowship with one another, God is pleased. That's what God intends. I believe, though, that there's even a deeper meaning as well. Although it was impossible for Solomon to have a well-developed New Testament theology, and he most certainly different or didn't, I believe here he brings out a strong Pauline doctrine. He brings out a strong doctrine that was promoted by the Apostle Paul very simply as this. As believers, we are approved by God. In your outlines, I wrote this down. By faith in Jesus, you are approved for who you are, not by what you do. Man, I wish I could park there for just a second. That's such a great truth because I believe in our minds and hearts, we have that all misconstrued. And we have this idea that that whenever we do right things, God smiles on us. And whenever we do wrong things, God judges us. And if I wake up in the morning and I have devotions, then it's going to be a good day. And if I wake up in the morning and don't read my Bible, then it's going to be a bad day the rest of the day. And God disapproves of everything I do the rest of the day. Church, I want you to understand this. By faith in Jesus Christ, when you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you are approved for who you are and not by what you do. That's such a great truth. Notice with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, a little bit of a longer passage. Paul says this, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So then we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. If we're not careful, it's so easy for us to have a legalistic mindset and we fail to realize that today, even though I'm not perfect, even though today I've failed several times, I am still accepted, I am still loved by an almighty God. Not for what I do, but because of who I am. I am a child of God and you are a child of God. And so whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, God approves it, is what Solomon is saying. Now listen, just though because, or just because we are positionally approved by God though, does not give us the right to live any way that we want to live. If we're not careful, that's what the Romans were saying in Romans chapter 6. They came to Paul and said, okay Paul, see if we understand this right. Every time we sin, God's grace is demonstrated in our life, right? And Paul's like, that's right. You sin, the grace of God is demonstrated in your life. So, Paul, wouldn't it make sense for us to sin more? 
Because every time we sin, God demonstrates His grace. So more sin, more grace. More wickedness, more grace. Doesn't that make sense, Paul? And Paul gives one of the strongest responses in the New Testament. He says, God forbid, by no means, how can those who have been saved from that lifestyle continue in that lifestyle? So here's the next thing that I wrote in my notes that I want you to get. When you trust Jesus Christ, what you do is transformed to reflect who you are. Did you catch that today? When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, what you do is transformed to reflect who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life, old things are passed away and all things are becoming Man, many of you here today could give testimony to the fact that you gave your life to Christ and God is changing your desires. And He changes you not from the outside in, but rather He changes you from the inside out. And yes, the things that used to be fun are no longer fun. And the things that you used to enjoy, you no longer enjoy. Why is that? Because you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you, who is working in your life, and who is molding and shaping you into who He wants you to be. Church, I'd say this. I'd say this. If you are a believer and you still can live the exact same way that you lived before you gave your life to Christ, with no conviction, with no sense of guilt, with no sense of, I am not pleasing God. If you can do that with no sense of conviction, I would examine your life. Because the Holy Spirit of God is in you. He's been placed within you to change And that's such an important point. Here's what Solomon is saying. God desires for you to enjoy life. Enjoy food. Enjoy life. Enjoy fellowship. Realizing that you are a child of God. Let me give you a second thing that he talks about quickly. The second thing he says is this. Not only is food a gift from God, enjoy it, he says, but secondly, marriage is a gift from God, cherish it. Marriage is a gift from God, cherish it. Verse 9, live happily with the woman you love through all the days of your life that God has given you under the sun. Now, how do you cherish marriage? Let's break down the verse, or verse 9, so we can understand how each of these phrases apply. So I'm going to put the phrase up, and then we'll talk about the phrase. Notice, the first phrase is this. He says, live happily with the woman you love. The first point is this. You cherish marriage by enjoying life together. You you cherish marriage by enjoying life together. That's exactly what Brad was illustrating here when he says, man, you know what? Man, I've been given a family. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to cherish time together with my wife and with my family. Live together is the idea that Solomon is saying. Listen, husband, your wife should be your very best friend. Wife, Your husband should be your very best friend. You should enjoy each other's company and spend more time with them than you do with anyone else. Enjoy life together. You might sit back and say, yeah, but Brian, you're not married to my husband. (laughs) Or Brian, you're not married to my wife. Listen, Vicky would say the same thing if you backed her into a corner, right? All right. Listen, listen. God has brought you and your spouse together. All of us go through struggles. All of us go through difficult times. And yet I find in our marriage, the more time we spend together, the more we love each other. 
And when the pressures of life seem to pull us apart, it's at those moments that we begin to struggle. And so you cherish marriage by enjoying life together. Notice the phrase once again. He says, live happily with the woman you love. And so you cherish cherish marriage by loving your spouse unconditionally. In the Bible, love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment. Men, when we're commanded to love our wives just as Christ loves the church, that's not a a gushy, romantic feeling that he gives. It's It's a commitment. His love for us is unconditional. Think about this today. Is there anything that you can ever do to make God stop loving you? Anything? No. Man, man, you can raise your fist to him and you can curse him. You can, you can doubt everything that he's done in your life. You can even doubt his existence. You can tell him that you don't want anything more to do with him. And yet his love for you is unconditional. He loves you at that moment just as much as he loved you the moment before. That's the way you and I are commanded to love our spouses, to love them unconditionally. Notice the next phrase. Live happily with a woman you love through all the meaningless days of your life. Here's what he's saying, and and I want to say this, and I want to put a caveat around it, okay? Here's what he's saying. He says the same thing that God says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, and the same thing that the Apostle Paul reiterates in Ephesians chapter 5, the latter part of the chapter. He said, Here's God's plan. God's plan is one man, one woman, forever. That's God's plan. One man, one woman, forever. Whenever God gives you this person, live with them throughout your entire life. Now let me pause for a second. And I understand the struggles of life, and I know that some of us here today are not in our first marriage, and we've gone through negative experiences. My point to you is to start from this point forward, and to say at this moment, I am with the person that God wants me to be with. And so from this point forward, it's me and my wife forever, or me and my husband forever, and we are making a commitment to each other for the rest of our lives. That's what happiness is all about. You cherish marriage by demonstrating marital fidelity. Fidelity. Men, that not only means physically, that also means mentally. That means emotionally. Make sure that you are 100% loyal and faithful to your wife. Let me show you a fourth phrase that he gives, all right? He says this, the wife God gave you is the reward for all of your earthly toil. Okay, guys, I want you to look at your wife right now and simply tell her this, you are my reward. Go ahead, guys, do it. Come on, guys, do it. Hey, all right? (laughs) You are my reward. Would you pause for just a second? Vicki, you're my reward. All right? That's what he's saying. He says, listen, listen, you got a tough life ahead of you. And God says, I get that. Man, I put you in the garden. You got to toil. There's weeds. There's all kinds of problems. I get that. But I'm going to reward you. Here's your reward. Your wife is your reward. She is the reward that God has given to you. The writer of Proverbs says that it's in Proverbs 18, 22. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure and he receives favor from the Lord. All right, so, so Solomon is talking about enjoying life. And so he, first of all, he says, food is a gift from God. Enjoy it. He says, secondly, marriage is a gift from God. Cherish it. And he mentions a third thing, and I don't want to be a downer today because you're going to think, Brian, man, don't talk about that as the weekend. The third thing he says is this, work is a gift from God. Do it well. Work is a gift from God. Do it well. Notice verse 10. He says this, whatever you do, 
do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. I love how the ESV translates the verse. It says this, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Colossians 3.23, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. You might sit back and say, Brian, I have the meanest boss in the world. Man, I dread going to work every single day. Now, I hope that's not the case if you work at Hollywood Community Church. I hope that, all right? All right? Listen, remember, you're working for the Lord. Remember that God has placed you where you are. And if you were here on Sunday night, you heard a great testimony by by Kelly Davis who who talked about God had placed her in a new job and she was wondering what was the reason that God had placed her in the job and she'd come to realize that God had placed her in the job to share her faith. And Kelly has shared her faith with some of her co-workers and Ashley, her co-worker, is here today. And Ashley's given her life to Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why is that? Because Kelly sat back and realized, listen, this isn't just a job. God has placed me here for a purpose. And she does her job, and I'm sure she does her job well. But not only does she do do her job well, but she realizes that there she is a representative of Jesus Christ. So here's the challenge. Two things in your notes. First of all, make the most of your abilities God has gifted you with abilities. Use them. You might have the ability to lead, the ability to work with your hands, the ability to teach, the ability to resolve problems, the ability to think creatively. Whatever it is, make the most of your abilities. And the second is this, make the most of your opportunities. Make the most of your opportunities. Because here's what he says, the day is coming when you will not be able to work any more. So make the most of those opportunities. Realize that God has placed you in your place of work for his honor and for his glory. Here's the point Solomon is making. Enjoy life. Whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's at church, enjoy life. Let me give you two more points Quickly, the next thing he talks about is this, understand life. In verses 11 and 12, and I won't spend a lot of time here because Solomon has already addressed this in the book of Ecclesiastes, yet God repeats it here for a reason. Let me give you the points. First of all, he says this, many of life's events happen unpredictably. Many of life's events happens unpredictably. Notice in verse 11, he says this, I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Sometimes the fastest runner falls down. Sometimes the fastest runner gets hurt. The fastest runner doesn't always win. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. The skillful aren't necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. Listen, life doesn't always turn out the way we think it's going to turn out. Life doesn't always turn out the way that we want it to turn out. Many of life's events are completely unpredictable. Has anything ever happened in your life or somebody else's life and you thought, man, I didn't see that coming? (laughs) That's not what I would have expected to have. Something completely out of the ordinary took place. He makes a second point. Catch this. Many of life's tragedies happen unexpectedly. Verse 12, people can never predict when hard times might come. Like a fish in a net or a bird in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. You've seen the commercial, I think it's for bear aspirin or something, where, you know, the waiter comes up and hands something to somebody, a little piece of paper, and they open it up and says, you're going to have a heart attack today. (laughs) Doesn't happen that way. Life's most tragic events happen 
unexpectedly. I don't know how many times we've received a call from a family, one of our families, and they say, Brian, so-and-so passed away completely unexpected today. And we're like, man, he or she was in church on Sunday. I, I just spoke with them. Listen, the tragedies of life don't happen according to plan. You're not given a warning. Here's what Solomon is saying. You must be ready. You must have a strong faith. You must have something to hold on to. Something stronger than you. Learn to trust God in the good times. So when the bad times come, you'll be ready. If you have nothing to cling on to during the good times, listen, you will have nothing to cling on to during the bad times. When those tragedies come, you will be all alone. Develop a deep faith right now. Let me give you a third thing, and I'm done. The third thing he says in the rest of the chapter is this. Live wisely. Live wisely. Solomon tells a story. Whether it's a true story or not, we don't know. Some think that it happened to him. Some think that he was simply telling a parable. We're not sure. He says that a small town was attacked by a great king. And in spite of the king's greatness... And his army's might, the wisdom of one man, saved the town. I read that and I want more information. You know, you kind of read and say, is there anything else? I want to know who the guy was. I want to know what the guy did. But Solomon doesn't give us any further information. He says this though, this is what he says. He says, strength can be overcome by wisdom. Strength can be overcome by wisdom. Verse 16 says it this way, wisdom is better than strength. Verse 18 says, it is better to have wisdom than weapons of war. It is better to be wise than it is to be strong. I would remind you that true wisdom only comes from God. True wisdom doesn't come by getting that post-grad degree. True wisdom doesn't come by seeking that terminal degree. True wisdom only comes from God. James says it this way, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. One last point, and I kind of want to take just a second because this is so important. The last thing he talks about is this, a lifetime of wise choices can be destroyed by a moment of foolishness. What is what he says in verse 18, the latter part of the verse, but one sinner can destroy much that is good. Chapter 10 and verse 1 is dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink. So a little foolishness spoils great honor. Man, I've seen it in my life. You've seen it in yours. I've seen people that have made a lifetime of wise decisions. And one moment of foolishness, one giving in to pleasure, one moment of giving in to sin wipes out, to a certain degree, everything they've done in the past. And I've seen it with ministerial friends of mine pastors of mine that that God used for years in one moment of indiscretion, one moment of weakness, one moment of giving in to temptation, destroyed their lives. I've sat with pastors who are going through that. I've sat with families that are going through that. Can, Can I give just a little bit of wisdom today to you? It's not worth it. The pain is worse than the pleasure. A lifetime of pain is worth much more than a moment of pleasure. So here's what Solomon is saying. You want to enjoy life? Make wise decisions. A moment of foolishness can erase a lifetime of wise decisions. I get that. It's a day-to-day process. It's a day-to-day process when we realize, okay, God, I know what my weaknesses are. 
And God, I know that at any moment I could succumb to those weaknesses. God, protect me from myself. Protect me from temptation. Put a fence around me. Oh God, help me not to succumb to foolishness. You see, wise choices produce a happy life. Unwise choices destroy life. I've said, and, and I'm done, but I've said, I've, I've sat with pastors that have run their lives, and I've sat across the table with them with tears streaming down their face, weeping, realizing the mistake that they made, realizing, wishing that they could do it all over again. And I often comment, I wish I could film those moments. They're deeply intimate. They're deeply personal. They're deeply painful. But I wish I could film those moments for us to see this. Sin does not pay. Foolishness does not pay. Freedom, freedom to do whatever we want does not produce joy in life. It's only when we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we allow him to change us from the inside out that we experience true joy. On the other hand, I have the opportunity to sit with couples that have been married for 40 or 50 years. And if they've just, as they've just lost their spouse, to sit in the living room, and even though their heart is broken for their loss, to see the joy that they have of a life together. And we sit and we laugh about memories. And we talk about a good life. You see, here's what Solomon says. God wants you to have fun. God wants you to enjoy life. He's given you food and drink. He's given you a loving wife or a husband if you're married. He's given you a family if you're not. He's given you a church family. He's given you people with whom you can enjoy life. Take all that God has given to you and live it with gusto. And realize that, hey, we only, we're only here for a certain period of time. I quoted that song last week. Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. Jesus said it this way, I've come to give you life, and I've come to give you life more abundantly. Do you have that life today? Enjoy life. Are you having fun yet? Yeah.